as Pastor John mentioned, the first part of that reading is a favorite at funerals and memorial services, although most familiar in the King James Version. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, would I tell you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I have to confess that every time I hear it read in the King James Version, there's a song from the 70s that goes through my head. Delta Dawn, what's that flower you have on? Could it be a faded rose from days gone by? And did I hear you say he was meeting you here today to take you to his mansion in the sky? We just revealed our demographic. <laughs> and there's that picture, right, that a lot of us have when we hear it, that, that this is primarily about Jesus promising that after you die, believe the right thing or do the right thing, you get to streets of gold and mansions. Well, one challenge in that particular interpretation is that in King James English, mansion then does not mean what mansion means now. Mansion is not a really large house in the Catalina foothills or the Sam Hughes neighborhood. Mansion just meant room. The room. Rooms. So Jesus is saying, in my father's or in God's house, there is a lot of room. Many rooms, many dwelling places, as the more contemporary translation put it. And we're also reminded, while of course there is this understanding and idea that there's more to life than this physical existence, Jesus' primary focus wasn't just a deferred payment plan, that the only goodness of God is known after you're dead. And so those two ways of looking at this passage are often then missing the point. That Jesus is speaking to, we might say, the realm of God. It's the language that's used in other Gospels. And that in the realm or the space of God, he's saying, there's room for everybody. There is room for everybody. And in the stratified society of under Roman occupation in the first century, this was really good news to people. Because where you could go and, and what spaces you were allowed in depended a lot on your ethnic identity, your religious persuasion, your gender, the color of your skin, your socioeconomic status, and whatever you're born into, you usually stayed there. So there are lots of spaces you could not get into. So Jesus saying that in God's realm, in God's way, everyone has a space, everyone has a place. There's this old spiritual that speaks to this, plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in my Father's kingdom. Is the chorus plenty of room plenty of room no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey just say i got space for you and then jesus is saying and if it weren't true i wouldn't tell you i'm preparing a space for you a place for you and this is jesus as trailblazer we might say that it's not jesus standing back and saying go on in good luck but rather jesus saying let me show you how to abide in these spaces in god's realm god's house where there's room for everybody and even though the society then is more stratified than our society now, we still get this, don't we? I mean, if we have the resources and are privileged enough to fly on an airplane, we know there's that curtain, that curtain that separates the cattle from the people who will receive a meal. <laughs> and it's a real experience. And of course, I mean, more complex, but still, the trends are, if you have fairer skin and a higher income, you will live in places where the schools are well-resourced and your children will have great opportunities or better opportunities to go on to college and to have jobs that will earn higher incomes. And the odds are, the trends are, that if you have brown or black skin and lower incomes, you will have schools in your neighborhoods that have less resources and less success rates and that often the children will have fewer advantages, right? Which spaces are you allowed in? And even though there may not officially be redlining, we still live in the realm of what that created about where real estate agents, depending on the color of your skin, would say, we won't guide you into this house. You need to live over there. These are realities in our society. And Jesus saying, God's reality, how God wants it, how God sees it, lots of room for everybody. There are many, many rooms in my God's house. And then we move, though, into this next line, and it might feel like we want to tap the brakes or slam on them, or we feel whiplash, because then Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
And if we're just thinking about the ways we usually hear that interpreted, might, wait, wait a minute, Jesus said everyone's welcome. Now here's this exclusive claim. Because that's what a lot of Christians have done with that verse. A lot of Christians have read this verse as if Jesus were only talking about the afterlife, who gets into heaven, and as if he were addressing the World Council of Religions. Neither are the case. Jesus is talking about all the ways we are invited into God's space and realm, and he is a Jewish rabbi speaking with fellow Jewish people about how do you enter into the spaces, this expansiveness of God. And he knows, he's grown up in it. There are people who think you're already part of whatever God's doing just by virtue of your birth or your club membership, so to speak. You're in the right religious club, done. Or others who thought, well, if you just follow all the rules or coerce other people to follow all the rules, that's what it's about. That's how you do God's stuff in the world. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm showing you a way to truth and life. That if you just think it's about your club membership or you just think it's about following certain rules, you're going to miss the truth. You're going to miss the life. I'm showing way to truth and life. He's showing this path this way that we live into the truth of who we are and that we live the fullness of life that God has meant for us. And the, the way of Jesus, there's lots of ways to describe it. We see it again and again in various gospel readings, but it's the way of letting go of life, just surviving, just getting by, just kind of life management project, a daily choice to let go of that and to listen for how God is still speaking, how to connect with the energy of God's spirit that is creative and abundant, how to hear the stories that are life-giving, how to gather in community, take, bless, break, give. Remember that from not long ago? And all these ways that he's saying, follow me, follow me, and you will live the truth of who you are, which is the beloved children of God, magnificent manifestations of the divine in the very image of the creator of the universe. That's the truth of who you are. That's the truth of who everyone is. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you the way to experience that truth. And living into that truth, you are accessing, connecting with the life that God intends, which is not just survival. It's not just getting by. It's the life that we talked about last week, abundant life, the fullness of life, vibrant, animated, expansive life, more justice, generosity, more joy. You're on the receiving end of that kind of life, and you are living and sharing that life with others. And there's room for everyone, not just the select few, not just the super religious, not just the people who are born into the caste system of priesthood. Everybody, anybody, no matter who you are, or where you are in life's journey, Jesus says, come follow me and live the truth of who you are and receive the life for which you're made and embody that life in the world because that is bringing healing and hope and help to everybody. One way for me that's been helpful to think about, well, how does that work? And some of you know I have a biology major background, so I'm a little bit of a science nerd. But someone said to me, we're a nerdy church, so you'll fit in well here. And if you're not nerdy, you're still, no matter who you are, where you're on life's journey. <laughs> so one thing, a concept that's helpful to me, thinking about how does this work in terms of real life, is um, it comes out of, uh, neuroscience and also evolutionary biology, but looking at what's called mirror neurons. Any of you heard of mirror neurons? So this is the idea and, and research that shows this, that for example, that when I'm doing this, and if you can't physically see this, what I'm doing is I'm waving my hand back and forth. And that both the visual, if you're seeing it with your eyes, or you're hearing me tell you that I'm waving my hand back and forth, that the neurons in my brain connected with waving my hand back and forth, those same neurons are firing in your brains as if you were waving your hand back and forth. They measure this, showing the same things are firing as if it's happening in you. And there's this idea, too, that the more that you would see this, and experience this and put yourself in front of the hand waving back and forth or hearing about the hand waving back and forth, the more likely you are to wave your own hand back and forth. It just keeps getting reinforced. And the most common experience of this that we've had, <sighs> the contagiousness of the yawn, which I know is dangerous to do in a church service. <laughs> but that is mirror neurons at work. And so then evolutionary biologists look at, well, what's the point and purpose of these mirror neurons? Why do we have them in us? 
and they seem pretty unique to humans as far as we can tell. So why would we have evolved with these? And the thinking is, the understanding is, it helped us understand each other better. It helped us know what was in, so to speak, the mind of the other, and therefore we could better cooperate. And better cooperation will help us have offspring that live. And so the, whatever genes selected for mirror neurons get passed on. So we're a long legacy of people who cooperated. Kind of sad that it seems like there's less cooperation now than there used to be. I don't know if that's really true. It just can feel like that sometimes. I'm going to read you a quote from one of the scientists who talks about this. Um, this is Richard Cozzolino, and this is from his book, The Neuroscience of Human Relationships. He writes, Mirror neurons and the neural networks they coordinate work together to allow us to automatically react to, move with, and generate a theory of what's on the mind of others. Thus, mirror neurons link us to each other. But it doesn't just work positively. There can also be the negative. And he writes, it means we can also pollute each other, thrusting anxiety and fear into each other. So that's the negative, the, the downside, so to speak. And I think about well, how that one works. Maybe it's sometimes more obvious. Mob mentality. Right? Even in the biblical story, there's the, the people. Here's Jesus, the one who's healing and loving everyone. Here's Barabbas, the terrorist. Who do you choose for Pilate to release? And we hear that there's people in the crowd stirring up the crowd. Release Barabbas, release Barabbas, release Barabbas. And there starts to be the chant, Barabbas, 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 and Barabbas. And then Jesus is dead and Barabbas is let go. Right? That's a way that that can work. Or I think about, for me, I've been reflecting on, we had yet another mass shooting yesterday, Dallas, Texas. This epidemic of people being slaughtered. And that there, though, seems to be the will of politicians isn't to pay much attention to that, but with deep concern for what books are in our libraries or the clothing worn by the people reading them. You think that's what's massacring people, given how much energy and attention and laws being passed. So we can pollute each other's minds. It happens. Fear, anxiety, scarcity. Social media. News media, right? We keep having those images again and again, and it just rises up. It's not spontaneous. It's spread across the land. Everyone's talking about fill in the blank. And again, that could be on the positive side of this beautiful story. Back, Remember when there were three channels? I'm going to reveal the demographic again. <laughs> right? But where, did you see 60 Minutes last night? And at least a big portion of it. Uh, wasn't that a lovely story about XYZ? So there can be that spreading of something that's beautiful or life-giving, but then have you heard the latest conspiracy theory about who's out to get us or who's wanting to destroy us or whatever, and that spreads the same way. So Jesus, this way to truth and life, Jesus is saying, so follow me, and a way we might think of it, if you're a little biologically nerdy like me, is Jesus saying, put yourself in front of me, and I will help activate the mirror neurons that connect you better with who you are as God's beloved and help you live the fullness of life that God intends. Because again and again, he says, don't just believe things about me. He says, follow me. Do what I do. Live like I live. And so there's this recognition. There's a daily choice. Do I put myself in front of what is about fear and scarcity and hurt and harm and injustice, or do I put myself in a path and in the way that opens me daily and moment by moment to the God who is just and loving, who has room for everybody. And when I live into that, well, there's more life in me, and I've got more life to share with others. And all that, those are kind of big ideas. So that's why I like to usually share a mundane story. So I have a mundane story. Because it starts with the mundane and the everyday. So I was thinking about a person in one church I served she never had anything good to say. I mean, never in my experience. There was always the critique, always the complaints. If there was something veering on a compliment, it was going to be backhanded. And what was my response? Well, there was something in me that wanted to argue all the negative points, fight, and then mostly what I gave into, because I didn't seem that wasn't very pastoral, but neither is this, flee. Right, avoid, step away. Oh, here she comes. Oh, hi. You know, oh, phone call. 
No, right. I didn't really do that, but, but that, I'm, I'm sharing with you, though, the internal response to something that feel, felt negative and, and scary to me. I didn't want to be in that. And there was this time, though, I was with a friend, and this person came up to us, the one I'm talking about, and she offered the usual kind of tirade about something. And I watched my friend, and, and, and she, she just listened and nodded, and there are a few points she said, you know, you might consider this differently, but said it in love. She didn't accept everything, every critique, every negative thing, but she just offered, you might see this differently. And I watched, actually, the kind of anxious energy of the woman who was complaining. I watched it calm down a bit, and then we departed from each other. And I turned to my friend, I said, how did you exert such self-control? And he said, actually, you're on the wrong end of the scale. This was not self-control. That was surrender. Where I had surrendered to my right to be right about things, and I was surrendering. My prayer has been, God, help me love people who drive me crazy. And he said, Michael, you actually taught me a prayer, which was ask God to help you see the person the way God sees them. So that's what I've been praying and I see someone that probably received a lot of negative and critique from her own childhood family, maybe has experienced some trauma, and this is how she's learned to cope or push people away or feel safe. And what she needs is not me to run or to fight with her, but to love her and be with her. And so that's what I've done. Whoa. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about. There's room for everybody, even the people we don't want there. There's room for everybody. And Jesus shows the way to the truth that you and the people you don't like are the beloved children of God, magnificent manifestations of the divine. And we don't always know it or trust it or live it, but as we receive more fully daily this life, this energy of the spirit that is just and generous and good, well, the more likely we are better equipped to love people, to love the friend, to love the enemy, to be like Stephen saying, don't hold this in against them, even as people are hurting him. Imagine that kind of compassion, that kind of healing, that kind of hope applied to our relationships, applied to our systems, applied to the structures of how we order ourselves. Imagine that kind of capacity for love, for generosity, for joy, for justice. But what we're imagining, Jesus calls it God's house. Sometimes he calls it the reign of God. And he says it's at hand. And we can be part of it. Everybody.